Everybody, I want to introduce to you uh, Andy Byrne. He's a friend of mine who's the pastor of Upper Room Christian Fellowship in West Lafayette. And he's not the founding pastor of it, but he's only their second, like, real, you know, full-time pastor person, which means he had some big shoes to fill, especially because the uh, founding pastor is still at the church. And uh, that's, a, that's an intimidating assignment. Yeah. But one of the things that I find to be the coolest about Upper Room Christian Fellowship is just the tight-knit community that your church has always striven to be. And so, Andy, I want you to start by introducing yourself just a little bit. Tell us who you are, some things about your family, but then tell us about uh, the church and what does community mean in the context of Upper Room Christian Fellowship? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so I, my name's Andy Byrne. I am married. Uh, my wife, uh, Shalyn, we've been married 25 years. Uh, this past June, it would come as no surprise, we did not get to do a, a good trip uh, in June. We have four kids. Uh, from grad school on down to a freshman in high school. And uh, I've been at the Upper Room for all of those 25 years, and the Upper Room is, uh, there's lots of different uh, aspects of it, but one of it is uh, the, it's very volunteer-oriented, lay leadership. Uh, and so we've been involved um, in leadership for all of those 25 years, but for most of that, I was a middle school history teacher. And we uh, led the uh, youth group, and we have led home groups, and I've even preached. But my full-time job was, uh, was in education. Six years ago, uh, the need uh, came to our leadership team that we needed to uh, have somebody else full-time. And so I became uh, full-time at that point in full-time ministry. And so that's a little bit about me and about the upper room but I would say uh, one of, and I would agree with you, I, it's nice to hear other people go, hey, you know what we see at your church is that th there is community. And, and even in our name, uh, there's no question in a biblical sense that our church is a church, an ecclesia, those who are drawn out of the world to gather periodically, hopefully several times a week, maybe even every day sometimes, um, but we call ourselves a fellowship because when our church was founded in the early 1970s, it was founded around this time period where there was revival going on, uh, there were miraculous things going on around Purdue University and in our community here, and there was a deep desire to, uh, throughout the week, gather with one another and not just gather together for songs, which was great, or teaching, which was good, um, but for fellowship, for relationship. And so that was how it was founded. And uh, in fact, they even founded it, um, first it was a prayer meeting, and then it was, you know, they'd have book studies and, and Bible studies, and they were always eating meals together in, in the early 1970s. And so that was the, the foundation of the upper room uh, coming together, and so we've tried to continue to do that. And so part of our uh, environment, our, um, our gathering, what defines us, is we even have a meal after every Sunday. We uh, eat, uh, 250, 350 people will stay after the service and will serve lunch, as well as m many of the midweek meetings, home groups, those will have meals. Uh, and so we've tried to continue not just meeting together once a week and not just meeting together for um, uh, teaching and worship, but really to be a tight-knit fellowship group. So, so what are the core elements then of the community that you're talking about? I heard you yeah. mention uh, lunch. I heard you mention uh, groups gathering. Do you have like um, an identifiable, these are the things that we do to yeah. strengthen our community? Sure, and just like you're going through the, your core values this, this month, we really find our core values in, in Acts 2, where the, uh, the believers devoted themselves, and that devote is a word that we're really, uh, as we move on to where we're at today, we're really uh, focused on. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, so we want good biblical teaching, uh, and they devoted themselves to prayer, and so we want uh, to be devoted to that and to fellowship and then to breaking of the bread. And so those are the four aspects. And so any 
part of our meetings are usually focused around w one of those four things that we find in Acts 2. Excellent. So that was all pre-2020. Yeah. What, right. what happened in 2020? Yeah. Uh, in what ways did any of that change? Yeah. And just as everybody uh, looks, you know, there's this tension I see in, in the year 2020. Uh, I, I read a, a joke and it said, you know, the, that 2020 was the worst year ever if you've never lived at any other time in the world. Uh, in, in history and being a historian, that's really true. Yeah. Um, but it really was. So that's, uh, you know, the joking part. Oh, it really wasn't that bad. But on the other hand, there was some some pretty significant difficulties, um, not only with uh, COVID and people getting it and family members having significant um, uh, sickness as, as well as death. Um, but it it changed uh, what we did. And so what we did uh, when the f state first shut down, is uh, we went into our small group, which we call home group meetings. And the first week, I think it was March 15th, if that was a Sunday, um, we actually met in person because we didn't know how widespread this was. And so we met in, we have seven functioning home groups, but we met in nine specific groups for that week. And so two of those were large extended families that broke out. Okay. <clears throat> and then the other seven uh, were our uh, usual home groups. And then after that, um, we continued to rely on those home group leaders and those home group meetings to be our church and our community. And they met on Sundays and they met on Wednesdays. The, we did make some changes, um, and one of those was I would record and send out a weekly encouragement, uh, kind of a sermonette, uh, much shorter, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, to kind of focus each of the groups, hey, this is what we're praying for, this is what we're um, dealing with. But the, that Zoom technology allowed us to continue the interaction which became, which was really, you know, we came together, it was uh, par for the course, it wasn't that difficult to do. It became really intentional. And, and that's where that word in, in Acts 2, devoted, really became important. We say intentional today, but we recognized that we really needed to be intentional with that. And so you really leveraged your home groups yeah. effectively divided into nine smaller churches. Yes. Um, but what did you do to stay connected? You were doing the videos of a message each yes. week that then got distributed to everybody and you right. were using Zoom yes. somehow to connect all those groups together? Right. Yeah, and what that did was it continued. There's great teaching out there. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that 2020 did is I've gotten to listen to Lafayette Community Church, and I've gotten to listen to River City, and, and I've been able to tune in to all of the great teaching that's out there, and there's great worship. You can go on YouTube and, and find a great worship set, probably better than any of us can do, although you're mm. good on guitar. Uh. <laughs> um, and so there's great worship, but the part that we didn't want to let go of was, how are you doing? How are you handling quarantine? How are you, you know, what are the job situations in, in each of the groups? And so those kinds of conversations and caring for one another uh, and praying for one another took place in those Zoom meetings. And then those home group uh, leaders were in communication with me or one of the other elders. And so that was kind of the communication uh, guideline between that. The elders continued to meet. And so we did, the elders continued to meet in person almost every week. There were a few that we went to Zoom because somebody had been exposed and, and that kind of thing. But uh, we were able to meet distanced and, and with masks and in, a, and in a smart way, but still be able uh, to keep our core leadership meeting with one another. Um, and then the other really important thing that we did was we had a meeting early on where we gathered all of those leaders, which nine group, little churches, it was actually 25 or 30 people because uh, we, hus we had husband and wife and then they had a co-leader. Mm. But we gathered all together and we really just went through our directory 
and we said, we want to make sure everybody is at least being contacted and that we're caring for our, our flock at that point. So that was a really important meeting. Excellent, excellent. Um, so that's how it all began. How did yeah. it develop through the year? What changes yeah. did you make as things went on? So that, ha that, that went on until the last weekend in May. And in the last weekend in May, um, we moved to live stream. And um, what had happened be between March and May is different people began to feel different levels of comfort with meeting with, with one another. And actually, that really uh, did well that we were in different home groups because it wasn't me or another elder top down saying, this is how you have to meet those different home groups were able to make their decisions based on the comfort level of their group. And one of the messages that uh, we spent three or four weeks on was deferring and preferring to one another. And that was really important because if I have a certain held belief and you have a certain held belief, we should be able to coexist with, with one another. And so our home groups were the were the ground where that really, th that discussion took place, but that's where they had the closest relationships. And so those were much more seamless than top down us trying to, to make those decisions for people. So then in um, what live streaming allowed us to do was uh, those who felt comfortable could come back together. We have a large gym sanctuary area that probably holds five or 600 people if pre-2020, if we were all packed in. And so we were able to spread out um, and have uh, what we felt like were safe meetings. It's got high ceilings and it was really, we were, it was the spring and so we were able to open doors wide and we really felt like we were able to do it in a wise way. Um, but only about a third of the people came back uh, mm. in person and, um, so what we did was uh, we would have our Sunday morning, a, a pretty similar type of a meeting. It was shortened because we didn't, have we didn't have any youth ministry to start off with. And then again, we relied on that midweek home group meeting to touch everybody and to talk with everybody and to check up and to make sure their, their uh, people were being cared for. And so that's what we went to uh, in May, and we've continued to do that. We're probably at, um, I would say, half or probably over half of the people are now coming on a Sunday morning, but we still are really relying on those home groups. Some of them are still meeting in Zoom. Some of them are meeting in person. Some of them are sharing meals together. So there's a real difference of how comfortable people are but we want to give that kind of freedom to those individual groups. Mm. Gotcha. So the biggest change about um, 2020 that I've heard you say yeah. seems to be primarily motivated by the coronavirus pandemic. Yes. That um, the changes that you've made have been largely with regard to that issue from right. 2020. Um, were there any other changes that you noticed yeah. in your congregation from, from any of the other issues? For sure. I mean, I would say there were three uh, main um, challenges, tests, trials in, in 2021 was COVID. Uh, the second, I would say, was the racial uh, issues that we saw throughout the country, Kenosha and um, uh, Minnesota, um, Breonna Taylor. Uh, and so that was the, the second real challenge. Um, and then the third was the election cycle. Uh, and that again is where the smaller groups really helped us because you and I, I can sit here and you and I could probably disagree about almost anything. I, I can hug you, well, not yet, but at some point. I'd still give you an elbow. <laughs> you know, I'd elbow, you know, we'd yeah. still love each other and be able to leave, but some guy that I don't really know or I'm not really connected with um, saying something that I would disagree with might rub me a little bit. Mm. Uh, in a wrong way. And so uh, we were able to, in, uh, whether it be on a Sunday morning or in those videos that I was sending out, be able to talk at a, at a kind of a basic biblical level, um, but then allow the discussion to take place 
uh, among those smaller groups. And I think that was really valuable. Um, and it was, uh, it was valuable in the sense of when you talk about fellowship, when you talk about community, we as believers have to be able to agree and disagree better. We have to be able to agree and disagree. I don't know, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say like Christians so that they will know us by our love. Mm. And being in small groups has really helped that. Gotcha. So then big picture, when it comes to the community of your church, um, did 2020 reveal to you anything that you didn't know before? Did you learn anything about your church family? that you didn't know before? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think what the, the things that we ha had thought were solidified. And so I don't know necessarily if, if we learned anything, but where we had said things like, um, you know, racism is a very important issue to one person, and another person, they would say, you know, I'm, I'm not that concerned about, uh, about racism, but I'm concerned about the economy. Whereas we would always say, well, those things should be able to live in community with one another. What it revealed was that that's a lot more difficult to do than it is to say. And so the trials and the tests came in really walking those things out. When push came to shove, and those issues are on the forefront, are we able to, to love one another in the midst of those? And so I don't know if it, it necessarily revealed anything, but it brought up, okay, are, are we going to do this or not? Are we going to be ecclesia, those drawn out for a central purpose, or are we going to be divided by uh, preferences and, and opinions? I'm, I'm hearing you say that this last year helped you realize that these issues that used to be opinions, now you're beginning to understand that in order for us to have community, we have to actually engage those opinions and talk about what the unity is above them, as opposed to just saying, I'm not right. gonna ask you that question and you're not gonna <laughs> ask me that question. Right, and so on a Sunday morning, you might not rub shoulders with a person that has a differing view. And so it brought to the forefront hey, these views are out there. And I think 2020 did that in general. Uh, racism, it's been a part of our country since the foundation. And the population that is not part of those who are being disparaged, it comes and goes on how it affects them. Well, it was affecting people. Mm. And uh, the, the huge divide uh, in political uh, thoughts and opinions and, and beliefs uh, those things were really brought to the forefront. And so, uh, and I would not only say that we should learn how to, we learned and were pushed to how to discuss those things, but how to not act like they're not important because there are important hmm. and go a step above that to recognize that whoever is in the political realm is not the king he's not the person or she's not the person that's in control of our kingdom. And so it's, uh, it's been a challenge to, to really stand on that because it's tiring. And I would say one thing, something else, you know, it would be a lot easier if I could tell you, you know, our, our church is a group of people and we're all the same. We all agree on everything, uh, but I, one, I don't think that's what the Lord wants of his church. And it's certainly not what we experienced. And so I th when I look forward, and I, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm hopeful that we are going to be stronger because we were able to look at um, the, the differences, love in despite of those, and, and still serve the kingdom of God, recognize really what's the kingdom of this earth, but serve what's the kingdom of God. And I say that, you know, when we begin to meet again, will our numbers be what they were? Probably not. So I say that recognizing there are those that have said, because of this decision or, or that decision, um, 
you know, we were very careful not to, to uh, go for one political party or the other. We were careful uh, in how we handled masks. We were careful in how we handled these uh, different difficult issues. Um, but there will be those that said, you didn't do it like I wanted it, and so we're not going to be a part of, of you anymore. And that obviously makes us sad. That's the challenge of yeah. being a community right. or a family and not a cult. Right. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's easier to be a cult. You know, you don't agree with me, you just leave. But being family means I got to put up with this person and love this person, right. even when they're saying what they're saying at Thanksgiving dinner. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So go back to 2020 March, Andy Byrne. Yeah. And tell him what he needs to know. Yeah. In hindsight, you know, what is, what is the thing yeah. that you wish you had known back in March of 2020? Yeah, I, I told you we had that, that large meeting. We were actually close to, at that point, what the, uh, what the state had said. We want to keep our numbers under that. I think it was 25 at that point. We were close to that number. Um, and that was a, a group of what you would call deacons. We don't name them that, but they were leaders of those groups. And that was a really important meeting. And we tried to continue communication via email and calling people on the phone, and we'd even have Zoom meetings. Um, but we needed to do that meeting in person more. Mm -hmm. And what that would have done is, uh, I think, made sure that those leaders were feeling supported, mm -hmm. uh, that they were feeling connected to one another, because it, get, it got lonely between March and May, there were some, some tough days, some tough weeks in there. And so I, we as the elders and, and me personally, we should have done a better job leading the leaders. Um, so if you look at, you know, our, our structure, we have elders, there's six of those, and then, you know, 25 or so of this next core. Uh, we should have done a better job uh, in, that, in that communication. Now, I'll tell you, those 25... Uh, they're uh, just amazing, <laughs> and they uh, connected with the Lord in new and amazing ways. They doubled down in the Word. Um, they found their own worship uh, music or their own worship ways, uh, and those that group is really healthy, but we should have done a better job um, in, in that kind of structure um, connecting with them. Gotcha. Yeah. So, now that you have the chance to look forward, um, do you think you're going to do things differently moving forward, or do you just want to get back to 2019 as soon as possible? Well, there's no question. We want to get back to having meals as soon as possible. Uh, so there's, you know, there's this word in Acts 2, it's, and, and the breaking of bread, which obviously means communion. And so we want to have communion, whether that's in your families or in your home groups or in our large church. But we also feel like there's something valuable and really important about sharing meals. And that's why we do it. It costs money. We put our budget towards it. Uh, and so we definitely want to get back to that. But there are some things that I don't think the Lord wants us to get back to. Uh, the Lord wants to move his people. He, he allows things or he does things for two main reasons, I think. Um, for his glory would be number one. And so whether he allowed COVID or he allowed the racial, however you see that happening, uh, it, it's for his glory. And the other is it's for our growth. And so I don't think any part of 2020 the Lord wants to waste and for us to go, oh, we're just going to backpedal to that. And so we're really, as, as we look forward to, to 2021, we're looking forward to, okay, how can we grow and how can we give him glory from the things that we experienced? Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to get back uh, to the way things were. There's some things that we want to continue, <laughs> you know, that we want to do, but we want to do them um, in a more glorifying way in a, it, where we've, we've matured with one another. Um, I think, you know, you talk about uh, being able to have those conversations with one another. I think it would be great if we could have difficult conversations. That's par for the course. 
and, and do that in um, a mature um, Christian, I love you sort of a way. And even if we disagree on major political, racial, um, medical issues, to be able to, to love one another as we leave that conversation. Um, I think probably one of the things that we've learned is that's not going to happen on any social media <laughs> platform, but it is going to happen in ecclesia. Mm. It's going to happen in church. It's going to happen in fellowship. And I think as I look forward, that's going to be something that as the world sees the difficulty and the mess and the muck that is out there, they're going to go, where can I really get authentic relationships with one another? And I hope that's the church. Well, you know, if people could see the church as being a group of peacemakers, yes. they might consider us to be children of God. <laughs> I would say that's scriptural. Yeah, I think it is. It's <laughs> somewhere in there around Matthew, Matthew. 5, yeah. <laughs> Jesus' own, it's in red. It is it's, in yeah, red. Yeah, it's in red. Yeah. Um, so just as we close out, let's get personal. Yeah. You personally, yeah. what did 2020 mean to you? What have you learned about yeah. yourself, your relationship with God? Yeah. Uh, somebody told me when I was going, and this was only six years ago, they said to make sure that I ministered out of the overflow. And what that meant to me was my relationship with the Lord, first and foremost, uh, needed to be my focus. And that proved true. In, in 2020, uh, because there were days where there was a lot of pressure, and there were days that, you know, I didn't hear from anyone, uh, and regardless of what was going on on those external fronts, uh, I needed to be connected with the Lord, and so when I did that well, I felt like I wanted to glorify the Lord, and I wanted to grow in Him, and I could take whatever was thrown at me, and when I wasn't connected with him, and whether that be um, going on a prayer walk or uh, listening to music or going on a hike in the woods or reading the word or listening to great teaching, um, when, I, when I was doing that, I felt connected and I felt ready. And when I wasn't, I, I really felt dry. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was part of it. Um, the other is... Uh, we're all called to be pastors in certain ways. And uh, as a dad, my first goal is to pastor and to lead and to love my wife and children first. And I learn uh, the importance of that in some cases because we were quarantined together. And, you know, outside of a phone call or a Zoom meeting, that was who I was related to. And that actually was a great blessing of, of the year 2020. Um, and I, that was something that I, that I really learned and leaned upon. And then probably the third thing was uh, at the upper room, we have shared leadership. And that group of elders really functions uh, together, not one having more authority than the other. And I was really thankful for that. Because some of these decisions um, were, uh, some of the, the responses, they were too great for one person to, to really be able to handle or, or to understand. And so having uh, other brothers to share that, um, to be able to, when people asked a question, to say, I don't know, let the elders talk about it and we'll come back with an, with an answer. Was, was really valuable for me. I think I, if it were all up to me, um, I would have made a lot more mistakes. Not that we <laughs> didn't make mistakes, but there would have been a lot more uh, and the pressure would have been a lot more. Um, and I think the, the challenge to connect with the Lord would have been even greater mm. because of that outward pressure. Man. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. You've challenged me. You've encouraged yeah. me. Um, I've got one final question. Yeah. I know you don't know the people of Lafayette Community Church too yeah. well, um, but they're people who love Jesus. Yeah. They want to love him more. Yeah. They want to represent him more. And so you can have a general idea of who they are <laughs> and who God is leading them to be. Based on 2020, yeah. what is the most important thing that you want the people who watch this video 
to take away. Something from your heart, something about uh, the community that you've experienced this last year or anything else, what would you say is the most important hindsight is 2020 lesson that you'd like to share with the people who watch this video? Yeah. So if you're a member of Lafayette Community Church, or actually if you're just listening to this, I want you to buy a magnifying glass. And I want you to carry it around in your pocket or put it on your desk. They make paperweights that are magnifying glasses. Um, And I want you to view that uh, as a, a lesson from the year 2020. Because we need to magnify the Lord. Mm above and beyond any other thing in our lives or in our country. And uh, I want, it's not just magnifying, there's several parts of that word. And so there's magnifying that it brings it into focus. So this year, I'm going to have to start wearing reading glasses. Uh, And that brings things, those are magnifying glasses, that brings Mm -hmm. things into focus that, that should be in focus. And when you put on reading glasses, everything else kind of looks fuzzy, yeah. except for, for what you're focused on. And it also is the idea that what we're focused on, obviously being Jesus Christ as, as believers. And as we're more focused on him, he becomes bigger. So you put a magnifying glass on something that it, it becomes bigger. And I think that we've learned, uh, and I'm hoping that we've learned and continue to learn that those fuzzy things, that those get stripped away, Hmm. that the Lord uh, is doing a a good work. He's coming back for a church, a bride that is spotless and and without blemish. And I think those spots and those blemishes are the the things surrounding what should be making him bigger. Hmm. And um, I, I think as uh, we look forward as a group of believers, whether it be at Lafayette Community or, uh, or at the Upper Room or anywhere in this community or really anywhere in the state or even the country, I hope that we're so focused on Christ that we begin to see the fruit grow from that, like love and joy and peace. And, you know, we, we talk about uh, the fruits of the Spirit. We talk about uh, the Beatitudes, the type of attitudes that we're going to have. If we're focused on the periphery, if we're focused on those things that are a little bit fuzzy on the outside, we're not going to bear that kind of fruit. And so my challenge to myself, to our church, and I'll spread it out to Lafayette Community Church, um, is to, to magnify the Lord. Uh, look up uh, on Google or on your concordance the word, you know, magnify Bible verses and just read through those. I think if we're magnifying the Lord, we're going to be on the right track to bear the kind of fruit that he, that he would want us to bear. That's a good word. Um, one of my favorite Bible verses on magnify yeah. doesn't actually have the word magnify in it. <laughs> it's the one where Jesus says, if I am lifted up, yeah. then I will draw all men towards myself. Yeah. And I just love that picture that Jesus says um, to predict his own crucifixion. Yeah. That as he is lifted up from the earth as a, on the cross, right. people will then be drawn towards him. But I also see it as a testament to when the church lifts him up in worship, yeah. when they lift him up in honor. And one of these days when he comes in glory, yeah. people will be drawn to yeah. the risen Christ. Yeah. And I hope and that John the Baptist, who says, he must increase and I must decrease is another great, it doesn't have magnify. I know we need to do all of them. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have the word magnify in it, but John the Baptist saying, Jesus increases and I decrease is another great verse that, that really, I think, would do us well to, to focus on. That's a good word. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andy, for yeah. being here. And um, I just want to let you know that I appreciate the ministry that you've been doing. Um, you have entered into a challenging environment a number of years ago, yeah. but you have, you have borne this mantle well from mm-hmm. my perspective. Thank Andy is now Thank the you. leader of the Greater Lafayette Gospel Association, uh, serving as the president for this whole year, which was an interesting year to do that. It was. Uh, we'll have to talk about that yeah. some other time, I <laughs> yeah. think. Uh, but thank you for joining us yeah. for this video. Thank you, Andy, for thank being you. here present with us too. Yeah, thank you. All right. Amen.
Amen. Yeah, this would have been a great year for you to continue <laughs> as the president no, of the GLGA. This was a great year for me to get out. 